Welcome. I'm Tricia Edwards, Deputy Director of Smithsonian Affiliations, and I'm so glad to have you all with us today. We're pleased to welcome you to our program, Lena Richard and Julia Child, Two Women Who Changed Culinary History. This is the second in a series of programs we're hosting this month to recognize Women's History Month and to highlight and celebrate the contributions of diverse women throughout our nation's history. This program series is supported by the Smithsonian American Women's History Initiative, which creates, educates, disseminates, and amplifies the historical record of the accomplishments of American women. The Smithsonian wants the role of women in American history to be well-known, accurate, acknowledged, and empowering, and we at Smithsonian Affiliations are proud to be part of this effort. Before we get started, I want to acknowledge that I'm speaking to you today on land that once belonged to the Piscataway and Pamunkey. We honor these and other native lands and appreciate the continual stewardship of them by indigenous communities. A few housekeeping items to review before we get started. This program is being recorded. The link will be posted on the Smithsonian Affiliations YouTube page in the coming days. Closed captioning is available. Just click the closed caption button in the toolbar on your screen and captions will appear. If you have comments, please use the chat box and I'm delighted to see so many great comments already. Um, be sure that you're sending your comments to all panelists and attendees rather than just all panelists so that everyone in the audience can see your comments. If you have questions for our presenters, please enter those in the Q&A box our staff will be monitoring both the chat and the Q&A. And please note that while on-topic discussion is encouraged, we ask that you express yourself in a civil manner and treat others with respect. The Smithsonian monitors comments and may remove participants from the program in accordance with its terms of use. A link to the Smithsonian's terms is in the chat for your reference. Finally, if you have a technical issue or a question unrelated to today's discussion, please use the raise your hand feature or type it in the chat box and a Smithsonian staff member will assist you. At Smithsonian Affiliations, we're proud to partner with museums and cultural organizations across the country to support them and their communities, people like all of you joining us today, while also furthering the Smithsonian's mission, the increase and diffusion of knowledge. Like the Smithsonian, our affiliate partners are committed to education and public service and work in collaboration with the Smithsonian to catalyze essential, sometimes difficult conversations in their communities and to help us all better understand the world around us. This work seems more important now than ever before as we collectively grapple with so many big issues, including the continued effects of a global pandemic, racial injustice, and climate change to name just a few. Today's program is a great example of the ways in the, which the Smithsonian and our affiliates work together to bring thought-provoking, timely, and relevant content to audiences like you. With the help of affiliate organizations from New Jersey to Texas, Massachusetts to Oklahoma, Rhode Island to Iowa, and everywhere in between, we're able to bring this program to many more people than we could with a single in-person program in Washington, D.C. And best of all, we're able to start a conversation not with one community, but across many. And we're serious about having a conversation with you. Um, we've already pro posted a couple of prompts in the chat and we're delighted to see all the feedback that we're getting about your favorite recipes and how you learn to cook them. Um, but there'll be other prompts from us and we hope that you'll share your stories, thoughts and resources so that we can all learn from one another. Smithsonian Affiliations is pleased to host today's program in collaboration with the National Museum of American History. The remarkable chefs featured tonight lived lives that span the entire 20th century. Their careers both changed and reflected the way Americans learned to cook, the use of TV as an educational medium, and perceptions of domestic labor and race. We'll hear more about these subjects tonight and learn how objects and artifacts from the Smithsonian's collection can help us in understanding this rich and delicious history. Now I'm delighted to welcome and introduce our featured speakers. Paula Johnson is a curator and director of the American Food History Project 
and had the unique experience of collecting Julia Child's kitchen for the Smithsonian from the great chef herself. And Dr. Ashley Rose Young is histo the historian of the American Food History Project and is currently working on two books. One is an academic work about the history of New Orleans street food culture, and the other is a biography of Chef Lena Richard, which she is co-authoring with Richard's granddaughter, Dr. Paula Rhodes. Tonight's program will be a dialogue about the lives and careers of these groundbreaking women, and we look forward to your questions. Please remember to post them in the Q&A box. And with that, I will turn it over to Paula and Ashley. Thank you very much, Tricia. Ashley and I are delighted to be here. And thanks to everyone for tuning in from around the country. It's great to see so many people from so many places. Our work at the American History Museum involves researching and collecting material to document the lives and histories of people from many different areas in food history. In concert with the Smithsonian's American Women's History Initiative, we've been focusing our work around women and their lives in food over the past couple of years. So the invitation to speak uh, inspired us to think broadly about two extraordinary women, one very well known and one not well known enough. So this evening, we will look at the stories of Chef Lena Richard and Julia Child, two women whose lives were very different in fundamental and significant ways. But their stories, which literally span the 20th century, re reveal some important insights about women and food in the United States. We'll be exploring what their stories tell us about gender, race, class, social networks, and the role of media in the context of American culinary history. So Ashley, let's start with you. Please tell us about Chef Lena Richard. I'd be delighted to. Uh, so for those of you who are less familiar with Lena Richard's story, I'll provide a brief overview, although I certainly cannot do justice to her incredible life story in such a short time. So please do check out the links we share throughout the discussion to learn more about her story and Julia Child's story in different ways of understanding the significance of their lives and their work. Lena Richard was born in rural Louisiana in 1892 and she moved to New Orleans as a young girl. Her early life mirrored that of other women of color working in domestic service. She started uh, working alongside her mother for an elite white family, the Varens, when she was around 14 years old. Her career, however, deviated away from domestic service to professional catering after she attended cooking school in Boston. And from there, she built a small culinary empire in New Orleans, all the while shaping public understanding of New Orleans cuisine. She showcased and celebrated the Black roots of Creole cooking in a time when pervasive racial stereotypes surrounded the food industry. Throughout her career, Richard owned and operated catering businesses, eateries, a fine dining restaurant, a cooking school, and an international frozen food business in the racially segregated South. She published her first cookbook in 1939 and was the first Black chef to author a work on Creole cuisine. Her reputation as one of New Orleans' finest chefs launched her into early food TV in 1949. Her program, Lena Richards' New Orleans Cookbook, was the first cooking show on New Orleans' local station, WDSU-TV. And Richard was likely one of the first Black chefs in the country, if not the first, to have her own self-titled TV program. So now that I've introduced you a little bit to Lena Richard, we wanna do the same for Julia Child. So Paula, can you provide us a brief intro to her story? Absolutely. Julia Child is a much beloved figure in American history. She's widely known for her many cookbooks and her 11 popular television series, which were produced from 1963 to the year 2000. She's also known for her role in elevating the profession of cooking, especially for women, and for inspiring generations of home cooks, encouraging them to learn new techniques and tools, to try unfamiliar ingredients and recipes, and to really embrace and enjoy cooking. 
There are several myths about Julia that often crop up. I hear them a lot. So I'll clear one up right now, which is that Julia Child was not French. She was an American. Um, despite the title of her first cooking show, The French Chef, she was very much an American in her outlook, her optimism, her general informality. Julie was born in 1912 into a wealthy family in Pasadena, California. And after graduating from Smith College, she was searching for a meaningful direction in life. And during World War II, she joined the Office of Strategic Services, the forerunner of the CIA. And that's the spy agency, not the Culinary Institute. Um, but this was first in Washington, DC. And then she went abroad uh, to Sri, Sri Lanka and China. And that's where she met Paul Child, who was also in the OSS. He was an artist and an intellectual whose expertise in wine and food were very exciting and, and new to Julia. They married uh, after the war and moved to Paris for Paul's posting as a cultural attache. And of course, it was in Paris that Julia discovered her love of food, her love of cooking, and the pleasures of the table. I'm going to stop here now because we'll be discussing more detail about Julia's life as we go forward. But now, um, since many people tuned in are members and supporters of museums, and thank you all for that, um, I thought we should take a look at the role of research and collections in understanding these histories. Ashley, can you tell us about your research and how you built your understanding of Lena Richards' life? Sure thing. So I have been studying and working on Lena, Lena Richards' life uh, since 2010, so for over a decade now. And when I first learned about her story in food television, I imagined that there would be recordings of her show in the local libraries and archives in, in New Orleans, and that was simply not the case. In fact, no known recordings exist of her television program. So when I hit that roadblock, I turned to materials that historians often rely on. Uh, newspaper article, articles, photographs, fan letters, recipes. Um, I learned that there is one archival repository that holds Richard's materials, and that is located at Tulane University. The collection is quite small. Most of the materials fit into one archival box, except for Richard's copper chafing dish, which uh, you can see in the slideshow. And so it's a pretty small amount of material. Honestly, it's about the amount of material that would fit in your uh, mailbox. So, you know, those materials certainly help us understand aspects of Richard's life, but none of them are accounts written from her own perspective. So it's been really difficult to gain insights into her lived experience, her opinions, her ambitions, goals, the challenges and triumphs that she went through. And so instead, we've had to rely on secondhand accounts to really try and understand her life. Um, I also reached out to the New Orleans community for their help and invited them to participate in an oral history project that would help us document the impact that Richard had on the lives of, of New Orleanians. And so for that project, I interviewed her family members, her co-workers at WDSU-TV and at her restaurants, some of the people who had actually watched her television program. And it was incredibly rewarding to hear stories of Richard's role as a community leader and as a mentor for so many people. I mean, those, those are the moments that really make this kind of work mm -hmm. as a historian so worthwhile when you can see just the emotional impact and the lasting impact that someone can have um, on their community, you know, 60, 70 years after they've passed away. Um, so again, it's, it's been a very rewarding experience to, to work on this story and, and to help share her life. So Paula, you know, you are studying another incredible woman. I'm, I'm curious to know what your research experiences have been like. I imagine mm -hmm. that they're quite different from mine, given Julia's, um, you know, she's a known entity. So can mm -hmm. you tell us about the unique challenges that you faced um, while researching mm -hmm. her life? Mm -hmm. Sure. Well, you said it, Ashley, with Julia, it's very much the opposite experience. There's a plethora of material on Julia Child and her life. 
She left an extraordinary paper trail, voluminous correspondence, television notes, scripts, uh, photographs, most of which are archived at the Schlesinger Library in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Um, many books have been written about Julia based on these materials. Uh, she also published 18 books and appeared in 11 television series over a 40 year period. Her books are still widely available and her cooking shows can be accessed on DVDs or via reruns by the, by the museum. What's more, her material life has been preserved by the museum. Um, as Tricia said, we collected her entire kitchen from her Cambridge, Massachusetts home in 2001. Uh, this collection includes some 1,200 objects and really represents her professional culinary career and her life in the kitchen at home, um, spanning about 40 years. The kitchen is on display when the museum is open. Hopefully it will be open again in 2021 um, and visited by, by thousands of people every year. Another thing we have uh, loads of evidence about, uh, Julia was intensely social. She had many friends and colleagues. She was active in organizations around the country and made friends everywhere. She's wildly popular on television and because of her personal style on TV, viewers felt that they knew her, uh, that, that she was speaking directly to them. And thus um, an astonishing number of people on the street and in the museum have something to say about her. We continue to hear testimonials about her impact from professional chefs and the general public alike. So for me, it's a matter of sifting through mountains of material. Um, I do think that further research on the material culture of the kitchen is an area that can perhaps yield some new insights and I'm looking forward to, to doing that work. And finally, I just wanna emphasize this point about museums as resources. Um, we collect objects and archives that can be used for understanding the past. And in the case of Lena Richard, the pursuit of evidence of her is, is so much harder than for Julia Child. But as Ashley has shown, it's possible to find those nuggets, those vibrant strands of Richard's story as museum curators and historians and, and speaking for the food history team, we are, absolutely committed to finding and shining a light on those stories that may be harder to find, but are desperately needed uh, to be heard. So turning now to um, another area, Ashley, an important theme that runs across the lives of both Lena Richard and Julia Child is their commitment to education. Can you just tell us a bit about Richard's experiences in cooking school and the impact that she had on the lives of young New Orleanians? Yes, of course. So while working in the home of the Varon family in New Orleans, Richard began taking culinary courses all over the city. And she got into those courses with the help of the Varon family's connections. They pulled a lot of strings so that Richard, as the young Black woman, could attend courses that would have otherwise been closed to her because of her race and her sex. So after taking what courses were available in the city, uh, with the support of the Varens and her own family, Richard went to Fanny Farmer's Cooking School in Boston. And while she was there, she really shined. In fact, classmates would often watch her during the course and ask her questions about her techniques, the ones she had perfected in New Orleans. And it was in those moments that Richard first had the idea of one day writing a cookbook. And, and she also discovered her passion for teaching while in Boston. Now, at this point, I'd like to take a moment to reflect on the racial dynamics in Boston when Richard attended the Fannie Farmer School around 1920. You know, although Richard had left the South, she still encountered racism in the North. As my colleague, Dr. Crystal Moten noted about this period in US history, it was not the Jim Crow South, it was the Jim Crow nation. Segregation was implemented across the country in so many aspects of life. You know, Richard, for example, had to secure written permission from all of her white classmates before she could officially be admitted into the course. And additionally, she had to take her lunch in a separate room 
all the while receiving praise from her classmates about her culinary expertise. The contradiction in her daily life is striking. Once back in New Orleans with her diploma in hand, Richard began her own catering company and women white and black sought her out for cooking lessons. They would come to her home and ask for help. And through these informal classes, she really honed her teaching skills and eventually began doing large scale lectures in auditoriums across the city. Uh, her classes were really in high demand, attracting hundreds of attendees. Now, what's really special and I think important to note is that her classes provided Black women in particular a rare chance to learn from a professionally trained chef. And not just any chef, but a Black woman who defied so many harmful racial stereotypes and had overcome countless barriers to rise the, to the top of her field. Years later, seeking to create professional training opportunities for young Black community members, Richard opened her own cooking school in 1937, specifically to train Black New Orleanians so that they might be able to demand higher wages in the local food industry, so that they could better their lives for themselves through food. And this was a key part of Richard's role as a leader and as an activist who used education to uplift members of her community. And I just find that so inspiring, especially her focus on education. It's something that her granddaughter, Dr. Paula Rhodes and I have really talked about. Uh, Lena Richards' granddaughter is an educator. Lena Richards' daughter was an educator. So it's something that really runs deeply within their family, that passion and belief in the ability of education to really provide opportunities uh, for their family and other community members. So Paula, you know, I want to know about Julia's experiences uh, with professional training and her subsequent role as a teacher because she she had such a passion for teaching and, and I'm kind of curious to know how she discovered that. Absolutely. Um, first, though, let me be very clear here. In terms of challenges, the discrimination and racism that Chef Lena Richard faced on a daily basis and throughout her life, there is nothing in Julia Child's career and life that compares in any way to those realities. Any friction that Julia encountered in her culinary education had to do with barriers based on gender. Uh, but because of her wartime service, um, Julia was able to attend culinary classes at the Cordon Bleu on, on the GI Bill and was allowed to participate in classes meant mainly for individuals planning to cook professionally. And at that time, that would have meant men. Um, Julia was not the first woman to graduate from the Cordon Bleu. That's another myth. Um, Dione Lucas was, um, and uh, but women were very few and far between at the Cordon Bleu. Julia took to the training. She jumped in with gusto. Um, she wanted very much to succeed and put in the hard work to master the techniques and, and the requirements of the curriculum. She was the only woman in the class that she attended and at six foot three inches tall, she towered over most of the other students and certainly over the French instructors. And of course, when it came time to graduate, uh, the head of the school, who was a woman, would not give Julia her diploma out of some sense that Julia didn't deserve it. Uh, the, uh, the diploma arrived very late and, and after an intervention by other people. Uh, the diploma now uh, belongs to all of us. It's uh, in the collections of the museum and you can see it here in the slide. Julia was eager to try teaching as well. It's so interesting to hear about the informal teaching that then gets larger and larger and larger with Lena Richard. Um, and when she was in, in uh, Paris at the Cordon Bleu, uh, she met a couple of people and with these colleagues, she established a cooking school in Paris, uh, the Ecole des Trois Gourmands, the Three Hearty Eaters. There's a hatch uh, from the school uh, also on the slide. Um, Julia always thought of herself as a teacher and a, and a cook throughout her life, 
Um, in fact, when she realized that, that few women were being admitted to the culinary schools in the, in the United States, she made it a personal charge to encourage more women in the profession and to make sure that they were admitted fairly. Um, and one more thing I just want to add about education is that Julia was a lifelong learner. She was intensely curious and genuinely interested in learning new things and, of course, in making connections with people uh, throughout the food world. She was very active in a number of organizations that had an educational focus and that had a scholarship focus and was also a co-founder of the American Institute of Wine and Food, which is a, an organization, such an organization. So um, we'll have to move on. Um, Ashley, uh, both Lena Richard and Julia Child relied on other women for support as they pursued their goals. And then in turn, they gave back to those same networks. Well, let's take a moment to flesh out the importance of those networks in their lives. Um, can you tell us about some of the women who shaped uh, Lena Richards' life, please? Absolutely. Uh, Lena Richards' daughter, Marie, played a tremendously important role in her life. And you can see the two of them pictured in the slideshow together. Marie was a home economics major at Xavier University in New Orleans, and she co-organized the cooking school uh, that they founded in 1937. And it was at that time that they started working together on Lena Richards' first cookbook. So Marie transcribed her mother's famous recipes, the ones that were known throughout the city, uh, you know, that were the talk of the town at various uh, events that were that were held. And she used her skills and knowledge that she obtained as a home economics professional at Xavier to really transcribe those recipes into uh, a form that would fit within the cookbook genre, the published cookbook genre. So their partnership was so beautiful and, and really fruitful. Uh, Richard self-published the cookbook a few years later in 1939 and it was very successful in New Orleans. I mean within a week of its publication word of her cookbook spread to other parts of the country demonstrating the power of women's networks to bring attention to books like Richard's. She had people phoning her and writing letters from different states saying how can I get a copy of your cookbook? Um, so Clementine Paddleford, a nationally known food writer at the time, was one such woman who expertly employed these networks. She actually connected with Richard and invited her to New York State uh, to, to the New York Herald Tribune Test Kitchen to give a cooking demonstration and to promote her cookbook. And what's interesting is this is where we lose some of the details about Lena Richards' story. It's not well represented in the archive what happened when she went to New York, but it seems that Clementine Paddleford and possibly James Beard played a role in connecting Richard to Houghton Mifflin, who then published her book for national audiences in 1940. And that significantly grew her national reputation far beyond the city of New Orleans itself. So you can see here how important these informal and formal networks within the publishing industry were for, for Lena Richards. So Paula, I'm curious to know, uh, what were Julia's networks like? You know, who did she collaborate with throughout her career? Everybody, it seems, but um, to really focus in on women's networks, um, especially during her early years, um, while she was in Paris and attending the Cordon Bleu cooking school, Julia met the two women who would become her collaborators on that massive project to create a cookbook of French recipes and culinary instruction for Americans, which became Mastering the Art of French Cooking. Uh, these two women were Simone Beck, who was also known as Simca, and Louisette Bertol. Um, here's another moment. I can clear up another myth about Julia. Um, she did not bring French cuisine to the United States. I've heard this over and over again. French dishes and techniques were of course uh, known and practiced well before Julia Child. But her book was an effective guidebook to French cuisine for American home cooks. It arrived in 1961 at a moment when many Americans were interested in travel and learning about culture through food. It was also the era of the Kennedy White House and Jacqueline Kennedy. 
um, and when fine dining in the United States meant French, period, French food. That's what it meant. Um, Another important woman in Julia's life was Avis Devoto, an editor and book reviewer in Cambridge, who was absolutely key to navigating the publishing world for mastering and other cookbooks by Julia. They kept up a robust communication by letter during the 1950s, truly an astonishing uh, partnership. And those letters form the book, As Always, Julia, which you can see on the screen. I highly recommend it. And, and then there's uh, Julia's editor, Judith Jones, who became legendary in her own right. Jones shaped the massive manuscript that the three authors had produced into the kind of text that really resonated with so many people. Um, she went on, of course, to edit Julia's other cookbooks and other major culinary works and, and other uh, books um, at the press at Knopf. Um, but um, notably um, editing Edna Lewis and other uh, culinary figures. So we know we have to do it, turning to television, it's time. Um, it, this is such an important strand in both of these stories. Ashley, tell us about Chef Richard's experience on the new medium of television in mid-century. <laughs> When Richard's program premiered in 1949, the set was fairly rudimentary because WDSU, the first television station in New Orleans, had not built their official studio space yet. So she hosted her program in front of a hand painted background depicting an open hearth kitchen. And you can see a few of those images in the slideshow. Her daughter Marie acted as her sous chef, again, that the importance of those family networks and, and networks among women. And because there was no functioning kitchen on set, they prepared all of the food ahead of time at the cooking school and brought it down to the temporary studio space twice a week for when the program aired. You know, we have to keep in mind that TV was, a, was new to New Orleans. WDSU TV began operating in December of 1948 and Richard's program premiered in October of the following year. Uh, to give you a bit more context here, prior to WDSU TV, there weren't many TV sets in New Orleans at all. Um, but by 1950, after Richard's program had been on air for about a year, there were 40,000 TVs up and running in the city. And the popularity of TV and food TV programming, really, it only grew from there. So amidst the early years of TV in New Orleans, Richard really carved a space for herself in a male dominated industry, in a predominantly white industry. And she also paved the way for the next generation of food TV hosts, including chef Leah Chase, who became widely known outside of New Orleans for her restaurant, cookbooks and civil rights activism, and whose story is told at the National Museum of African American History and Culture. So I think it's important to kind of acknowledge the connections between Lena Richard and Leah Chase because uh, you know, Lena Richard was about a generation earlier than, than Chef Leah Chase, but their stories are still intertwined. So Paula, can you tell us more about early food TV and what programs typically looked like in the 1940s and 50s? And how did food programs change over time between, you know, the, you know, the 1940s when Richard was on TV and then the 1960s when Julia arrived on television? I imagine it was a very different yes. kind of TV experience. Yes, completely different. Uh, it's really important to note that early food television, and we're talking in the 1940s and early 50s, really played into negative stereotypes of women in the kitchen. Early cooking shows were generally just instructional, featured women home economists demonstrating how to make wholesome dishes with an emphasis on thrift, on efficiency, and on nutrition as it was understood at that time. Most cooking shows were broadcast during the afternoon on the theory that only women would be watching at that time of day. Um, they were the main audiences for such instructional shows. So Ashley, I think it's really interesting that Lena Richard, a, a professional chef with her own businesses, was featured on television so early. And 
you know, albeit in a domestic setting, she was uh, in a troublesome setting. She was demonstrating recipes from her own cookbook, recipes that she was, um, that reflected her own work and the culture of her city. Um, she was not presented in the typically female homey role, but as a professional, uh, the way men would be featured on television, you know, decades later. You know, for Julia, she wasn't intending to become such a public figure through television. Her first appearance was on WGBH, Boston's public TV station, in 1962 on a show called I've Been Reading uh, to discuss her cookbook. Um, Julia, of course, ever the teacher, ever the performer, uh, showed up ready to demonstrate how to make an omelet uh, with her copper bowl, um, a balloon whisk, uh, a bunch of eggs, a frying pan. And she actually um, you know, went ahead and did this uh, demonstration. Well, it was so entertaining that the station received some 27 pieces of fan mail immediately. Um, she was then given a pilot show, and this was then followed by the, for her first series in 1963. It's important also to recognize that Julia's arrival on TV coincided with a significant leap in uh, television ownership in the United States, uh, which numbered around 52 million sets in 1962. Uh, but it was Julia's distinctive style and the break from you know, a staid demonstration, instructional show that really propelled her. It was her energy and her over the top personality really grabbed viewers attention. Um, her show was aired in the evening and was a hit with men, women, and even kids. Um, the Julia managed to uh, disrupt the gender biases regarding what I'll just call women in the kitchen she made the home kitchen and cooking okay for men and women alike. Um, people had a very different reaction to, uh, to Julia in the kitchen as she was wielding, you know, her tools, her mastering her technique and um, essentially, you know, making a uh, performance out of it. Um, she also conveyed the sense that cooking should be fun and really not drudgery. Uh, her self-effacing attitude when things went wrong in the kitchen. And of course, they do go wrong in the kitchen. We all know that because um, it, things happen. Um, also just made her totally lovable. Um, all of this added up to something that was surely not the kind of instructional um, program that was on in the 1940s and 50s. What's more, um, and this is important, she incorporated tasting, as, uh, tasting the food as part of the lesson. And that was very, very, very different. Um, in her later shows, uh, you know, she was on television to, until the year 2000. Um, her later shows featured cooking that went well beyond French cuisine. Uh, Julia welcomed other chefs to her stage, uh, to her big platform, and eventually into her home kitchen. Um, which is where the last three series of her television shows were taped in the 1990s. She was very generous and very supportive um, to the other culinary professionals throughout her, her long life. So um, as we wrap up, uh, we wanted to end on the thing that lies at the center of both Chef Lena Richards and Julia Child's lives, and that's food. And apparently for a lot of people who are on this call, because I've just been salivating at some of the things that you've been talking about in the chat. Um, for us, like for you, food is personal. So Ashley, tell us about these images that you're sharing. Yeah, so um, in 2012, so this is you know almost 10 years ago now, my mom and I cooked through several of Richard's recipes and we did this as a way to try to connect with Lena Richard. This was at a time where I was coming up against roadblocks, in, even in the archives, not finding that much evidence about her life. And, and I just, I wanted to get a sense of her. I wanted to get a sense of her spirit and, and connect to her in ways that um, just weren't present in the archive. And so uh, we decided to, to cook her food and it was, a tremendous, a tremendously um, educational experience. Her gumbo filet is 
phenomenal. It has become a staple in my home and a go-to at dinner parties. I, I love sharing her story with friends and family and then at the same time having a chance to really just appreciate her style and her expertise through her food. And so um, that has been so important. I mean, I have my copy of my cookbook right here. This is a copy of the 1940 uh, Houghton Mifflin edition. And I am referring to this cookbook constantly. It was given to me by one of the New Orleanians I interviewed who had watched her show and, and learned how to cook from Lena Richard when she had uh, just married and, and was a new bride and really didn't know what to do in the kitchen. So I kind of love that connection of this object, um, both to Richard's story, but also to other New Orleanians. So it is really fantastic and I do recommend please you know uh, try to cook from her recipes we are going to have a cooking up history coming up this is one of the demonstration programs we have at our museum and we'll be we'll be preparing some of her recipes and if you tune into that uh, free program you'll have a chance to learn some tips and tricks on on how to test those out so you know Paula I, I also want to hear from you tell us about your connection to Julia Child's recipes and cooking and, and what that's meant for you Yes, well, um, there are lots of stories. There's no question about that. But um, I, I'm focusing on one thing. Um, one thing we learned while collecting Julia's Kitchen is that she had a lot of fans among our staff. Um, so several years ago, uh, we encouraged anyone who wanted to try making something from any one of Julia's cookbooks to do so, to take pictures, to write about it, and post it on a blog called Do Try This at Home. Uh, this blog is still um, extant, so uh, you can take a look. Um, my favorite entry <laughs> was this one from, from Joe Christ, who has worked in the museum's cabinet shop for many, many years, and who was a key member of the team that dismantled Julia's Kitchen in Cambridge and, and who reassembled it in the museum, not once, but twice. Uh, first in 2002, and then again in 2012 when we moved the kitchen to its new location. So Joe um, got his mother and his son together um, and they chose to prepare Julia's Bouf Bourguignon, the first dish that she prepared on the French chef in 1963. And the result is shown in the slide. I grabbed it from the website, um, but you could see that, you know, they've taken great care on showing, showing it um, properly, um, a proper dish with a little wine. And if you read the, the text, they talk about how, well, this took three days, but it was sure worth it. And, um, you know, oh, the house smelled so great. And if we were going to do this again, here's how we would do it differently. I love this because this is exactly what Julia was telling us all to do and what I can still hear her telling us do, to do today. Try something new. Bring your friends and family together into the kitchen and above all, have a good time. So that is my story. I think we are heading now to Q&A. Thank you so much for your kind attention and for your enthusiastic chat. I just have to say that seeing all of those dishes fly by was just really exciting. <laughs> Yeah, thank you, uh, Paul and Ashley. Wow, what a just a wonderful walk through the lives of these women and the way they connect to the museum and to your research. And but the chat has been equally as interesting and inspiring for different reasons. Um, I just love all the stories that our audience is sharing and the recipes and how they learn to cook and favorite cookbooks. It's really a treasure trove. So thank you all for participating in that way. Um, so we've got some great questions. Um, and I want to start off with one for you, Ashley. Um, Mary Ruth is asking, you know, what role do you think Lena's race played in the fact that her achievements were largely absent from the historic record when you began researching her? So, you know, as a historian, when, and I'm writing a book project, like I, uh, like you mentioned earlier on New Orleans food history and in New Orleans and across the United States, black Americans have been at the core of American culinary culture and you know, unfortunately, in our archives, because of systemic racism, because of historic practices of marginalizing the history and the, you know, 
contributions of people of color, those stories are not well represented in our archives. It was when Lena Richards' granddaughter, uh, she donated those materials to Tulane University. That's when that archive and that archival repository was created, um, you know, detailing Richard's life, but that was decades after she had passed away in the moment when she was, you know, surmounting all of these barriers, when she was making a name for herself in New Orleans and nationally, that was somewhat documented in newspapers at the time, but certainly her story was not preserved uh, in the local archives in similar ways of white restaurateurs, you know, Antoine's, for example, in New Orleans, or if we're looking at the Brennan family, Commander's Palace, there's, New Orleans was the home of, of cuisine in America for generations. If we're talking about French cuisine period, New Orleans was one of the cities where that was happening. And so it really, unfortunately, our practices as archives and as historians in the past have done a tremendous disservice to communities of color and other marginalized communities by hiding their history. Um, but with very careful research, as Paula has mentioned, <laughs> you can read against the grain, so to speak, of, of the archives and, and get at these stories the best way that you can. But unlike with Julia, you know, we just don't have a lot of material. And so I have to make myself comfortable with the fact that I'll never truly know what Lena Richard thought about her experiences as a Black woman at WDSU TV, but I can kind of take the stories from her coworkers and, and how they talked about the race relations in New Orleans at that time to kind of guess at or surmise um, the kind of racism that she would have been experiencing and sexism. So it is unfortunate and it's definitely a product of historic practices for sure. Yeah, well, that's what is, you know, one of the reasons why your research is so important, Ashley, to start uncovering some of these stories and and, uh, and bringing these to the fore. Um, I think, you know, Paula, for you, Julia Child is almost the opposite end of the spectrum, right? She is, you know, the, the bounty of being able to connect, collect her whole kitchen. Um, and just the fact that we have this really rich um, record of her life and her career. Um, there's a question from Laura in the, in the Q&A though, asking, you know, how do you decide what's historic food material and needs to be collected by the Smithsonian? Um, and, and whatnot. And how did you make the decision to collect the whole kitchen versus just a handful of objects? Mm -hmm. That's a great question. Um, you know, we are always on the lookout for uh, material for the museum. And, you know, we have gone um, in, in various directions based on some of the priorities. I'll say that right now for their new strategic plan, we are really focusing on inclusion, we're focusing on relevance and the stories of people who have been traditionally underrepresented in the museum. And therefore, uh, as I said before, uh, the food team um, has been very committed to doing programming for many years um, about um, people of color and uh, culin culinary traditions that uh, may be less familiar. And we are always looking for collections as well. Um, in addition, this year we have an internship program for um, candidates from underrepresented communities. So we are, are making uh, those deliberate um, choices at this moment. In terms of collecting Julia's Kitchen, it was, we didn't think we were going to ask for the whole thing. We went up um, to visit her. Actually, we had heard that she was leaving her home in Cambridge to return to California, to Santa Barbara. And, um, you know, we asked ourselves, well, what's going to happen to her kitchen, all of her stuff? Um, so we actually called her and uh, she answered her own phone that day. And, you know, she said, well, just come up, let's talk. And we went thinking, well, maybe we'll ask for a couple of things, but mainly we want to talk to her about what's in the kitchen and it's just about her life. And as soon as we crossed the threshold, there were three of us into this kitchen, we looked around and the way she has everything arranged, it just all fit together into this caps time capsule of the second half of the 20th century in American kitchens. 
Um, there was stuff there from the Paris flea market in 1948 all the way up to just virtually yesterday. Um, and so we really decided, let's just try and see if we can collect the whole thing because we thought, and I think it's borne out by what we've seen over the years, is that people feel that this is their kitchen too. Uh, mm -hmm. People who watch those uh, television shows and who continue to watch them. Um, and it does have these layers of time, layers of place and layers of significance that I, you know, again, is just something that is, is really special. It also introduces our exhibit on um, transforming the American table in the second half of the 20th century. Because Julia, of course, was one voice among many who was advocating for people to um, perhaps do something a little bit differently when it came to food, whether it was convenience and efficient or whether it was, uh, you know, Julia Child. Um, so it's a complicated story, but um, that's, that's the bare bones. That's wonderful. Um, Ashley, um, we have uh, somebody in the Q&A asking if Lena Richards cookbooks are still available and can we get them anywhere? And, and another question from another uh, attendee asked, what were her signature dishes? Such a great question. So currently Lena Richards cookbook, the New Orleans cookbook originally published by Houghton Mifflin, it's out of print, but it is available on Amazon. I checked today for $23. <laughs> so you can find it on Amazon. You can also find it um, for a less expensive price on something like a book reseller website like Abe Books or something like that if you look for it. There's been several editions and iterations that have come out um, You know, every 10 years or so. I will say that, um, I will reference again that uh, Dr. Paula Rhodes, her granddaughter and I are co-authoring a book together right now and we hope to share in that work along with her story several of her recipes including some of the recipes that haven't actually ever been published but were family recipes um, the gumbo that her family ate at home versus the one that she made in her restaurants but I would say her gumbo filet very, very well known. It's what one of her, her fine dining restaurant, uh, Lena Richards Gumbo House was known for. So I would definitely check that out. Her Creole red beans and rice, stellar. Uh, she has a really fantastic technique for making the fluffiest kind of rice. Uh, you would you boil the rice and then you put it into a low oven, uh, a 200 degree oven for, you know, 10, 15 minutes and it just puffs up perfectly. It creates amazing rice. I would definitely check that out. Um, but we are looking forward to kind of um, updating those recipes for the modern kitchen. As Dr. Rhodes kind of jokes, uh, when Lena Richard gives the uh, instructions to make a roux, she's like, all right, add equal parts butter uh, and flour and cook until brown, you know, stir until brown. But for those of you who have attempted a roux for the first time, you know that it can be a pretty daunting process, especially if you're trying to get that really dark Hershey's chocolate bar kind of, of roux. So um, we're hoping to provide a few more tips and tricks on, on how to tackle those recipes in the kitchen. But like I said, you're not going to come across a better gumbo recipe than, than hers. It's so fantastic. So please do check out our Cooking Up History program coming up this summer because uh, we're going to be working with a local chef from New Orleans and really just providing some more insights into this fantastic history of Creole cuisine and, and Lena Richards' contributions to food. Wow, that sounds wonderful. I'm looking forward to that program. Um, Paula, there's a question from Karen in the Q&A asking, um, if Julia Child knew about Lena Richard, do you know if, if they were aware of, if she was aware of her or their paths ever crossed? That is such a great question. Um, and I do not know. Lena Richard uh, passed away in 1950, which was exactly when, um, you know, Julia Child was in uh, Paris. Um, prior to going to Paris, Julia Child was not really thinking much about food about, you know, fine food, and certainly not about cooking. So perhaps she learned about Lena Richard later on. I'm not sure. You know, did uh, Julia Child read Clementine Paddleford? Mm -hmm. um, did, did Julia and James Beard talk about it? You know, who knows? Oh, it's so, you know, I, 
the possibilities are really intriguing. And um, that's just something that it would be really interesting to try to, to try to uncover. Yeah, I think about that a lot because Lena Richard, as Paula mentioned, passed away in 1950. This is just about a year into her cooking program. Really, you know, she had made a national reputation for herself, but still there was so much left for Richard to do. And had she been able to continue on, continue mm -hmm. cooking, continue appearing on TV and, and publish her second cookbook that she had plans to do. You know, we, we just don't really know what would have happened to her life and, and maybe she would be a household name um, had she lived longer, we don't know. Mm -hmm. um, and I like to think of the idea that maybe James Beard and Julia Child had, had talked about Lena mm -hmm. Richard, but the archive doesn't reveal anything for us at this point, but you never know. There are still nuggets out there that we might come across at some point. Maybe there's a nugget at the Schlesinger. Yes. I mean, maybe, maybe there's something up there. It could be. This might be one day when we can reach again. <laughs> right. <laughs> a trip to the Schlesinger. Yes. Yeah. Um, one, this is not so much a question as just an observation. Um, that this is, we are doing this program as part of our Women's History Month programming. And last week we kicked off our series with some of your colleagues from the American History Museum talking, looking at objects from the museum's collection um, that helped illustrate um, um, African-American women and their activism. And those curators talk a lot about the importance of networks in those women's lives. Um, and, and you all also touched on that, which I was sort of unexpected for me. Um, I think particularly with Julia Child, you know, she's such a, an icon. We think of her like we think of so many well-known people that sort of stand, you know, on their own and they made it, they made it by themselves. And I don't know if you have anything else to add um, to what you already shared with us about the importance of the networks, particularly the networks that they had, um, of the networks of women that sort of surrounded them. I would love to hear any other, um, any other thoughts or ideas you have on that. Well, Julia, um, as I said, you know, she was so social. She reached out. She had many friends. She answered her mail. She had a lot of um, connections with people. And in fact, um, the, the people I mentioned in her early life were really key to that foundation that she then grew, uh, that she then built upon um, for the rest of her career. And of course she lived to be almost 92 years old. She was just two days mm -hmm. shy of being 92. Um, so throughout that period of time, she was keenly interested in, you know, the networks that she had, but then also helping other people and other women create those networks and create a way of supporting each other. Um, that was really a, a key part of, of who she was and who she became mm -hmm. later in life. And when you see those um, television shows um, uh, filmed in her kitchen and how she stands back and, you know, really wants her guest to shine, um, that that is just something that I feel she's being a mentor and, and part of being a mentor is, you know, helping people make connections. Um, I guess one other anecdote, uh, this is a funny anecdote, but um, uh, when we were interviewing Julia, um, you know, there, people often ask me, did she, did she cook for you? And um, the answer would be no. <laughs> um, but um, she was busy. She had her job, work that she was doing up in her office. But um, on the day that we did an interview, there was a, a pot of veal stew kind of simmering on the back burner. And uh, finally we asked about it and she said, oh, I had all these people here last night from, um, you know, Les Dames Scoffier. And um, they had been cooking and they cooked way too much. And it was so lovely to spend this time with them. And of course that was the last time that she would be with a particular group of women and that network before leaving to go back to Santa Barbara. Mm -hmm. And I could just tell that that was, you know, another iteration of, you know, being able to, um, you know, spend time with uh, the people who were so key to her early, early development. That's so important. And I, I'll just, you know, note that Lena Richard, she passed away, I said, in 1950. 
she never got to see the South and the United States desegregated. I mean, she was living through a race war, you know, the conflict in our country that we're still dealing with today. And she was fighting. She was fighting to uplift her community. I think she had a mentality where, you know, she had exceptional opportunities to go places and receive education that others were just barred from. And I think she felt, she felt obligated and she wanted to bring something back to her community to open doors for a younger generation to to uplift her community and get you know move forward beyond a racist segregated society but she knew within that she could help others of her in her community and so i really think it was all about it was all about building a stronger New Orleans, building a stronger community and, and being a role model and, and using her power where she, where she could to influence others positively. And I think similarly for Julia Child, it was, it was about breaking down those gender barriers. It was about creating opportunities for others. You see that in Julia's later food programming, uh, bringing uh, other chefs under her show, providing a platform for up and coming people. You know, these women were exceptional, but I don't think they wanted to be the only exception. I think they wanted to create opportunities for other and for others. And you know, that's what makes this work so great. It's can't help but smile when I think about what they've done for so many people. Thank you both. I think that is such we've got more questions, right? We could go on for another hour at least, but I think that's a really wonderful way to end um, as we think about as we reflect on Women's History Month and these amazing women and think about the role um, that each of them played. And I, it sounds like the responsibility that they each felt felt to um, help other women along and um, to not just um, capitalize on their own success, mm -hmm. but really use that success to help other women, women move forward. Um, so thanks you both. Um, this was such a wonderful conversation. We have so many great comments in the chat. Um, about how much people learned and enjoyed it. And again, thank you to all of our audience members for sharing wonderful recipes and stories. Um, we'll be sharing the link to the recording of the program as well as a transcript with the chat to everyone who registered. Um, so thank you so much for joining us. Thank you um, to my affiliations colleagues for helping with all the behind the scenes support. Thank you to our affiliates across the country for sharing this program with their communities. Um, next week, our series continues with um, our, our colleague from the Air and Space Museum, who's gonna talk about women in aerospace um, that are represented in our collection. So thank you again to Paula and Ashley um, for your expertise and enthusiasm and sharing your work with us tonight. Um, thanks thank to everybody you. else. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, thank you. Thank you all for joining us and I hope to see you again soon. Thank you.